five, four, three. It's the internet. You're busy. Let's do this for March 28th, 2024 for the next hour or so. Let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, more studios are getting jettisoned out of bigger companies as industry volatility continues and a classic PlayStation franchise may return on Xbox. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host to Game Mess Mornings. It's Marcus Stewart, everybody. Marcus, how are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you for having me here. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, glad we could have you here. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm especially glad because you guys know you guys have the, some Game Informer news to talk about and all that stuff. But we're going to get into that in a second. But, you know, before that, like how things been going for you? How how has this year been going for covering games? It's been kind of nonstop still since, uh, you know, since last year, right? Yeah, especially because everyone decided to put all their big like 90 hour RPGs within the first like two and a half months. Yeah. The only uh, way to celebrate the end of fiscal is with a 90 hour RPG. That's how we talk about it here. That is that is the goal. So, yeah, I'm personally woefully behind on a Same. lot of stuff. Yep. Uh, I've not beaten any of those games and I'm trying to figure out how to play them all at the same time and then realizing that's a mistake. I should probably just focus on maybe two of these at most. And then that's also a mistake. So maybe I should just focus on one at a time. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah I, I did. Uh, I did commit to beating like a dragon infinite wealth. And then I was uh, like, OK, well, maybe I can get to another one of these. And it turned out it's like, nope, used all my, my gaming juice up on that. So I've been playing stuff like yesterday. I, I did play some Dragon's Dogma 2 yesterday. I'm, I'm like kind of getting my footing in that game, really enjoying what I've been playing. Uh, but mm -hmm. then yesterday evening when I was like, I should play more Dragon's Dogma 2, I fruited around on my Steam Deck and was like, I'm going to uh, set up or fix my emulation and get things going. I like there's an update to Emu Deck uh, and I'm going to get that going and use a new front end to load all my emulators and stuff like that. So I, I did that for like an hour and a half instead of playing video games. I think that's where my brain is at right now, where I'm just like, ah, I want to mess around and not do too, too much else. So, so yeah, I get it. But yeah, new, news. You guys have some news over at Game Informer. What, what's going on? Yes. So if you've been following Game Informer's channels over the last couple of days, we announced a basically like a, a relaunch, a, a revamp of our subscription program. For those that don't know, uh, Game Informer is a magazine, still a physical print magazine. Uh, for the longest time, you had to subscribe to the magazine by going to GameStop and uh, signing up for the Power Up Rewards program to you know get access to the magazine, both uh, digital and print. And over the last uh, several months, uh, that process kind of for, for lack of a better term, broke, <laughs> mm -hmm. where the uh, print subscription, uh, you, you weren't able to get a print subscription with uh, with GameStop. Uh, why that happened, I, I don't know. It's literally like it's above Game Informer uh, what happened there. And I know it's caused a lot of uh, confusion and frustration where some people believe that we were that we stopped making a print magazine altogether and we're digital only, which was not the case. Um, so basically over the series of, uh, months, we've been working very hard trying to right the ship with that and, and get back on track and it's finally here. So the big change now is that yes, you can subscribe to the print magazine again, but for the first time, uh, I think in a, maybe ever in a very long time, you can subscribe to the magazine directly through Game Informer without having to go to GameStop. Right. Uh, so, and, and, a, and if I were hmm? so inclined, where would I go? So the URL is subscription.gameinformer.com. Uh, if if you want to go to the subscription page directly, you can sign up for a year, which gets you ten issues for just nineteen ninety nine, mm -hmm. which sounds like a weird price, but it's actually a fun reference to the year that Game Informer was founded. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. I liked it too when I heard it. Uh, so, you know, we've been around over 30 years now. So for $19.99, you get 10 issues delivered to you to your door, which is, if you do the math, less than $2 an issue. Mm -hmm. And even each issue is 84 pages of exclusive cover stories, uh, reveals, previews, uh, profiles, interviews uh, from our staff, as well as, uh, oh God, we have over, I think it's 65 freelance contributors that we've had 
uh, contributed some really awesome features to the magazine over the last year, year and a half or so from across nine countries, uh, all bundled together. You know, we our cover art is usually fantastic, too. Uh, always a big highlight for each issue. But yeah, less than two dollars a month for 84 pages of just video game goodness, information, all that good and stuff. The game magazine in the mail again, the way God intended. Exactly. Like, you get to hold it. And yeah. you know, some people like to frame them on their wall because of how cool the art is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, in an age where, like, especially in the U.S., like, uh, physical, like, media in general, it's kind of a. Uh, yes. Especially yeah, magazines. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, especially, it's, the country's too damn big. It's too damn big to, to sell magazines unless you're Game Informer. And I'm, that's why I'm glad you guys are still doing it. So, so yeah. Like, the, the when it's, like, so difficult for anyone to pull this off. The fact that we still have at least one, I subscribed right away, Marcus. I I was right there. I did a year. I'm going to do another year. As soon as that's up, I can't, I can't wait. Yeah, I've seen people re like just doing two-year subscriptions immediately, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, you know, and thanks to you and thanks to everyone else, uh, you know, our readership, uh, you know, our, our friends and, and, and peers uh, for the support because it does. You know, it's been a rough year, a rough, like, year and a half for, like, uh, obviously the game industry from like the developer side but also yep. for for media too you know which sucks and we have not been immune to that we've gone through god like several rounds of layoffs you know most recently we lost uh blake hester one of our writers and we're for those that don't know we're a very small team for uh, how much we yes. produce there's a uh, if you know we have six writers and five of them are full-time including myself that put the magazine together and you know a small uh but awesome production team uh, on top of that. So, you know, like we have not been, despite us, you know, being under a, a corporate umbrella, we have, <laughs> we have felt no, that's the, done nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the, the bad effects of this industry. Well, well been, no, no, just speak to that real quick. Like, so the subscription, when I subscribe, that mm -hmm. money is going to like go right to Game Informer, right? It is that money is meant to prop up Game Informer and not like, you know, sneak into GameStop's pocket, right? Yeah, I, I want to say like it definitely like I think GameStop still gets a, a, sure. a cut. But, but they like, own Game Informer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, they, they you know, they're our parent company, but it is a great way to show that uh, Game Informer is like it valuable mm -hmm. to GameStop and uh, help keep us around. It's a great way to support us. Um, and yeah, I know some people would rather, you know, that for whatever reason, don't want to go through GameStop. If you feel more comfortable or uh, incur enthusiastic about just subscribing through us directly, because uh, again, we haven't had that in a very long time. Uh, you know, this is the way to do that. So yeah, it's it's just so like, you know, it's just from like a pure numbers game, just to show that like, hey, you know, we really love Game Informer. We really respect the legacy. We really enjoy the work that, uh, you know, we put out. Like this is the, the best way to support that. And I didn't mention that the subscription not only gets you the print magazine, but it also gives you the digital issue too. So you get both. Fantastic. With, uh, the subscription. So if you, if you want to read it on your tablet or your phone. Right. You, you read on the both. tablet, you frame the magazine, put it up on your wall for the art. There you go. Yeah. So you get both versions of it for, again, nineteen ninety nine, ten 10 issues a year. Sounds great. That sounds fantastic. Uh, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you guys are doing this. I'm, I hope it goes very well. Um, and, and yeah, everyone should go, get out there and subscribe. Uh, one more time. That's subscription.gameinformer.com. Yes. All right. Subscription.gameinformer.com. Check that out, everybody. Uh, all right. Let's explain what we do here. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with Take-Two buys Gearbox Entertainment from Embracer for $460 million. This is from Haley Williams at GameSpot. After months of rumors that Embracer Group was looking for buyers for Borderlands developer Gearbox Entertainment, the studio is now officially being sold to 2K parent company Take-Two Interactive and a deal worth $460 million. 
Gearbox was one of Embracer Group's biggest acquisitions when it bought the company in 2021 in a deal worth up to $1.3 billion. As the deal was based on Gearbox reaching certain milestones, it's unclear how much of that $1.3 billion Embracer ended up paying out beyond the $363 million in guaranteed upfront payments. Now, as reported by Brian Crescente on Twitter, Take-Two Interactive has purchased Gearbox for $460 million, uh, which will be paid out in Take-Two shares. The purchase includes Gearbox Software in Texas, Gearbox Montreal, and Gearbox Studio Quebec, and will cover Gearbox IP, including Borderlands and Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, Risk of Rain, Brothers in Arms, and Duke Nukem. The sale doesn't include Gearbox's publishing arm in San Francisco, which published Remnant 2 and has publishing rights to the upcoming Hyper Light Breaker and other upcoming titles. The sale also excludes a number of studios purchased by Embracer through Gearbox software, including Cryptic Studios, Lost Boys Interactive, and Captured Dimensions. Take-Two has said that Gearbox will operate as a st studio within 2K, which has a long history of partnering with, partnering with Gearbox on the Borderlands series. Gearbox will continue to be led by its founder and CEO, Randy Pitchford, and his management team. Uh, not too shocking here, uh, right? We, we uh, knew that Embracer was looking to get rid of a lot of these studios that it did acquire, which, you know, Embracer was all gas, all gas, all gas acquiring, and now it's all break, all break, all break on trying to, like, get rid of these things whatever embracer's a mess uh when it comes to gearbox when it comes to borderlands there there was no chance that 2k and take two were going to let that um like that that team crumble or fall apart because it's too valuable valuable to them they've had so much success with borderlands so the safest way to deal with that is to make the acquisition themselves here we are take two now has borderlands and gearbox and then they don't have all of the other cruft that can't that comes with gearbox like the publishing arm they're like no we just want the team that makes the game that makes us money that's all we care about and that's how this deal seems to shake out any thoughts on this marcus um i'm excited to see tiny tina and gta 6 <laughs> yeah uh, it definitely feels like that's uh, more of a possibility now right why, why not cross promote those games um yeah put mad yeah. moxie and wb 2k uh-huh yeah that, that's where it really needs to happen um yeah I, this industry is very volatile right now and this seems to be a con like a, a a pretty common occurrence where the studio is either like has just been acquired is now getting acquired again or is spinning off to be independent we'll have a story about that here in a little bit um and i i guess the, the good news here is these teams aren't like being shut down i right. suppose uh, but this also just feels like, man, they are playing musical chairs because people are not like they were making all these acquisitions because that like looked like growth on a, on a spreadsheet. And now that now that that no longer looks like growth, they've been you know caught holding the, the, the bill on all these things. They're like, actually, we can't afford to pay for these studios. What were we thinking? And the, you know, the answer was they, they weren't thinking. And so now like sort of the natural evolution of a studio like Gearbox ending up at take two, it's like, okay, that makes some sense. And they're just, they're probably just going to make a lot of Borderlands games going forward for, uh, for take two and 2k. Um, I know that Gearbox wanted to like spread out and start making some other stuff. Uh, that stuff was recently canceled or put on the shelf. Although I know that uh, the reporting is, is that in addition to another Borderlands games, which we'll talk about here in a second, they have other games in the works. Uh, but I would expect 2K is like, no, just make the next Borderlands, maybe make, make the next Tiny Tina, um, and, and then we'll talk. I mean, is that your expectation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this was a good time for them to pick them up with the uh, the movie coming out this year, so they get to benefit from whatever... Yeah. You know, whatever good sort of like uh, trickle down that movie brings, you know, whether it's good or bad, we'll see. But like, you know, like Borderlands hype will be a thing again uh, around the time that movie comes out. And if it does well, just the idea of like, oh, yeah, we got a bunch of uh, upcoming projects based on this, like, potentially really successful movie. And that's that's ours now. This is mm -hmm. great. Uh, so, you know, good timing for them. And like you said, I, I, I didn't really worry that Gearbox was any like shutdown danger of like no. they're just too big and valuable for like you know like they're gonna get sold off so I, that was never really my concern so I, I don't know if i thought i guess i never really thought who would buy them but take two something about that i was like huh I don't know if I thought they would be the ones to do it, but that makes sense. I guess yeah. they got well, the money. When you like sit down and think about it, it's like, yeah, they're too valuable to take two. So this is like yeah. four hundred and fifty million dollars, four hundred and sixty million dollars is sort of like an insurance payment where it's like, okay, now we know that this team and this IP are protected and we have it. And really, I mean, then like take two spending four hundred and sixty million dollars to own the Borderlands IP 
that you know that alone's probably kind of makes this deal worth it for them. Then the fact that they get the team making it, uh, that that's only going to help. And I suppose that means they get you know if the movie does well, which who knows? I I honestly have no expectations for that movie. But if it does well, I guess they get that money as well. So they get the you know built-in synergy like that you were talking about. Um, when it comes to Embracer, though. Uh, that you know, Lars Wingerfers, whatever, a uh, CEO of Embracer, had a statement saying this is like us on our way to becoming um, leaner. Is is how is basically what he said, a leaner and more profitable. And it's just like, man, you were the the fattest duckling of a company during acquisition season when everyone's making acquisitions and the money was cheap out there and you were buying everything out there and everyone was looking around like, man, you guys seem unwieldy. Uh, you have hundreds of studios and 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 you know maybe almost a thousand games in the works uh, how are you going to make this make sense and they never had an answer when people asked that question and here we are that they because there was no answer and as soon it as things got question that, mark on the like steps to profit yes. it was the question mark <laughs> yes part. that was embracers <laughs> like that was the where they lived in that question mark on the chart um so I, listen, I don't think this makes them all that much leaner, uh, but it does save them some money. I'm sure that paying the uh, the the salaries and the benefit packages of the people working in Gearbox is expensive, and so you don't have to do that anymore. And then you get some money on the side here. Um, yeah, I I, I I don't think this changes much for Embracer. All I, I, th I think this maybe extends their period of being able to make some more sales down the line. But Gearbox was the big one for them, for sure. Uh, that was like the, the biggest studio, the most expensive studio. So it probably does help to some extent, but I don't think we wake up tomorrow and like now Embracer is, you know, headlong into making games and making profit. I don't, I think this doesn't necessarily like fix their, their problems. What do you think? Uh, no, I feel like this is still going to be a thing for at least the next year. If I had to guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I almost don't know what, the, what that looks like when they, when they've shaved up an, enough of themselves to say like, okay, we're, we're, we're level again. We're good. Uh, and then, like, how do they grow after that? Because it's like there's no way they can go on, like, another big acquisition spree. It, God, for the foreseeable future. And I, I think they'd be maybe a little bit gun shy to do so after this. Um, I, I just I, I'm more curious about, like, what is like post trimming the fat <laughs> embracer look like? Like, what do they have left? Right. And then, yeah, like and then just sort of their strategies for for growth beyond that. Or do they just like, hey, let's just. Let's just make money with what we have and maybe not get too like, let's just put our infinity gauntlet down for a while and, and, and turn off that mm -hmm. weird Thanos part of ourselves that we've been we've been running on for the last couple of years. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I'd say like the next year or so, this is still going to be like a yeah offload I, phase. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's clear the acquisition season is fully over and now they're in uh, just try to survive season, it feels like. Uh, all right. Uh, the next Borderlands game, however, is in active development. This is from Eddie McCoo at GameSpot. As part of the wider announcement that Take-Two has acquired Gearbox from Embracer, Take-Two announced that Gearbox is now in active, active development on the next Borderlands title. In February this year, Gearbox founder and CEO Randy Pitchford te uh, teased the company's next game, saying it is the greatest thing we've ever done. Oh, Randy. Uh, many believe it's the rumored Borderlands 4. The latest entry in the main series was 2019's Borderlands 3. In 2022, the spinoff spin -off Tiny Tina's Wonderland was released, and a sequel is reportedly also in the works for that. Um, yeah. That, I mean, almost certain. Like, do, would you expect them to do any, take any other risk in any other direction other than a Borderlands 4? To me, that makes all the sense in the world. What do you think, Marcus? No, that makes sense. I mean, again, with the movie coming out, it's like, yeah, this is the time to, like, double or maybe even triple down on borderlands like just assuming like hey this is going to be it's going to people are going to really want to play borderlands once uh cape blanchette is on screen uh so yeah i i didn't uh, tiny tina did pretty well for them right so uh, yes tiny tina did i think uh, exceeded expectations is my understanding yes okay yeah and you know that had been the first one in a while so yes yeah like i i fully expect like yeah just of course more borderlands sure Yes, uh, I, I, right. That seems to be the safe bet. That seems to be the thing where, like, if you are at Gearbox and you have to make yourself as valuable to these companies as possible that own you, uh, yeah, Borderlands is probably the direction you're going to go in. Borderlands, and then, and then when you like, okay, we're going to make a Borderlands game, Borderlands 4. I don't think you try to mix it up. I don't think you tried to make, like, oh, Borderlands World. And it's going to be the big live service, ever everlasting version of Borderlands. I don't think you even mess with that. 
just keep making Borderlands as is until the, maybe the formula doesn't work. And because Borderlands 3, I think, also exceeded expectations. It did very well for everyone involved. So, yeah, I think you just kind of stick with what works. Yeah, which is less exciting for me as someone that's kind of like tapped out of Borderlands after the last, like, I'd say after two, really. Right. Of like, man, I, I kind of would like to see a bigger swing with it. Not in a live service way, but like, oh, do something like, I don't know. I guess Tiny Tina is like the closest to that, but like. Yeah, I get, like again, this is me personally. It's like I would like to see something bigger and, and a little bolder with that series. But like I said, it does make sense to just like, yeah, just if it ain't broke, you know, just keep doing it. Yep. I, ex- yeah, exactly. And I think that um, uh, f- for for these games, it's like I'm someone who mostly I think I agree with you where I'm like, I'm not necessarily thinking, oh, I need to get back into a new Borderlands. But if they keep making them and they and then people still have this positive buzz around them, I could see myself being like, you know what? Why wouldn't I check back in on Borderlands 4? It has been long enough. Um, yeah, I always check in. Yeah, yeah I play all of them. And like, yeah, okay. It's it's Borderlands. It's cool. Yeah, I don't. I, I didn't play Tiny Tina's Wonderland or Borderlands 3, so I'm like, if a Borderlands mm. 4 were to come out, I probably would check on on that one. So yeah, like you, you've I'm recharged though. Exactly, Re- recharged yeah. my interest, and and I think that so it makes sense. And then that's a little bit easier for me to hop back into than something like a Destiny 2, where it's like you know it just keeps building on top of this foundation and there's more and more and more and now it's intimidating right. and i'm like i'll just wait until he put out something called destiny 3 and i'll check in at that point yeah. uh all right sega sells relic and will cut 240 jobs across uk studios this is from chris dring at gamesindustry.biz sega has sold relic entertainment and will cut 240 roles across sega europe creative assembly and sega Hardlight. Relic is best known for the company of Heroes and Dawn of War games and recently developed the new Age of Empires for Microsoft. Relic will transition to an independent uh, independent studio and will no longer be part of the Sega group of studios. Meanwhile, the majority of the 240 job cuts uh, are across Creative Assembly and Sega Europe, while there will be a small number of cuts from Sega Hardlight. Uh, There was no mention of other Sega UK studios, including Two Point Studios and Sports Interactive. Creative Assembly has already suffered a range of redundancies following the cancellation of its Hyenas project last year. Um, And then there's a quote here. Sega is working closely with Relic on this shift, and we wish them the best uh, for the future, wrote Jurgen Post, who is the newly appointed head of Sega of Europe. Uh, I want to sincerely apologize for the worry and understandable distress this news will cause, particularly for those directly affected. These decisions have been incredibly tough to make, and they follow meticulous consideration and deliberation with leadership teams across the business. Um, This is another. So we just talked about like, hey, musical chairs over there with um, with Gearbox and Borderlands, you know, going from it being independent to being bought by Embracer and then being bought by 2K while they try to make sense of like where that fits and who has the money to actually afford that team. And then meanwhile, like in a lot of, for a lot of other studios, it's like, Hey, either we might just close you down or do you want to figure something out? And it, it, repeatedly now we are at the very least, and I suppose this is good news, Marcus, uh, that these teams are finding ways to spin off to be independent. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's like a ton of money out there for them to get investment, but it seems like there's enough where if, if you're an established team, you can make something make sense where you're either borrowing money or you're getting in a, a direct investment so you can buy yourself out from a company like Sega to keep keep going. And you know, Relic does have a proven track record. Um, they, they uh, you know, Company of Heroes. Well, I know Company of Heroes three was a disappointment for many. Uh, I think there's an expectation that it's like they can maybe get it there over time, or they put out a new one that people do come around to. Like there's there's a lot of people who really like Company of Heroes, and so there's something there. Why would we let this team just fall apart when instead they can just go out and be on their own and keep things going? Uh, I, this i mean it's it's bad news wrapped in something maybe of a silver lining here what do you think marcus yeah it's kind of like the things have to get worse before they can get better kind of a thing yes of like yeah it's cool that like you're independent and you know we saw this with a was it toys for bob too not that long ago. exactly toys for bob yes we'll talk about them in a little bit yes yeah so yeah i guess like in the long term it's like cool you know i'm I'm glad you know like more studios you know being able to be self-sufficient is great and you know like more power to them it sucks that it had to come at the the cost of uh, over 200 jobs um but i mean i guess it's just the it's like i it's i hate using the term necessary evil because i feel like that's like kind of like corporate talk a bit like well there's no other way um but you know it's like i guess that this is like the last like big cut that gets us there it's like so be it i guess um you know hearts goes out to everyone that was affected in that 
Um, but yeah, I, I hope that, um, you know, I hope that they can find, like you said, I know funding is like weird right now and, you know, but I, I hope that they can kind of weather this storm and, and again, sort of like restabilize and, and, you know, continue making cool stuff. Like you said, Company of Heroes 3 maybe like didn't quite hit the mark, but, you know, like, I, I hope that that's like, I mean, it doesn't seem like it was, but like not some like weird death knell and that they'll get to make a, a Company of Heroes 4 or whatever it is that they decide to pursue. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we need, we need more studios and not less of them. Right. So. And, and um, you know, this is also a team that has proven it can do strong work for higher games, that new Age of Empires uh, that got, got pointed out there. So they have relationships yeah. with Microsoft who, you know, they we talked about it yesterday on this show. Toys for Bob has that deal. Like they got spun off by Microsoft, but then they immediately made a deal to make a game for Microsoft. Uh, I imagine that company, the, the Company of Heroes team at Relic, uh, the Age of Empires team at Relic could probably make a similar deal if Microsoft is so willing. And Microsoft does still need games, despite every, what everyone's talking about. Like the, there's a, um, you know, fewer people playing games or, or at least they're spending fewer hours playing games. Mm. That's going to rebound at some point. Like, yeah, it's dipping back down, but that's going to bounce back up. There are more people playing games over time in the long run. That's going to keep going in that direction. You're going to need to have something there for them. So you can't completely be like, well, we just stopped making games. We're all, we're washing our hands of it. So I think that if you are a team like Relic that has those relationships, you should be able to capitalize on those to a certain extent. And, you know, there's also the chance of, you know, spending some years working as a support studio, things like that, which I think would be a shame for a team that has done such work. I mean, people consider Company of Heroes and Company of Heroes 2 to be game of the year material. It's a team that's done some stuff that people truly love. So if they have to go do work, work as a support studio, that, you know, that's a little bit, that would be a shame, although no shame to the studio having to like make ends meet. Um, but they could have that opportunity as well and take some time, rebuild, and then once the industry is in a better place, be able to get some of these bigger projects green-lighted and go from there. Yeah, I wonder if there's a universe where Microsoft just outright acquires them because of those existing relationships. Right, you and, know? You know, and I'm like... That I do wonder, like, what is the state of acquisitions right now? Because, you know, I keep saying acquisition season is over. And it's like, because you look at this stuff, it's like there was a time when these uh, companies like uh, Gearbox would have gone for $1.3 billion. And now it's like, eh, $460 million at most. We're not going to pay anything more than that. Um, so it's like a lot of these, like, clearly the prices are coming down and the fervor is quieting for getting these studios and bringing them in and growing that way. But that, yeah, like a company like Microsoft still has to feed the Game Pass beast or is, are they like, hey, no, we have enough and we need to make do with what we have. And actually they aren't going to make any more acquisitions. And it's like, you know, we talk a lot about consolidation, Marcus, and the problems there, but there are also problems when the big companies stop making acquisitions, where it's now a lot of these studios looking like, what is the end goal here? We're trying to grow so that we can be an appealing target for an acquisition because we as the owners want to like cash out someday. And it's like, if there is no one out there buying, what are we doing all this for? It's actually, we're just kind of like running on a treadmill and we have to try to make the next big game. And that's really tough to pull off these days. So yeah, it's, it's rough out there. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we have a lot more headlines to get to, including a new Xbox. We'll talk about that right after this. All right, we are back, and that new Xbox is, it's the same Xbox, but with a new coat of paint and maybe no disk drive. Yeah, Images of a white, all-digital Xbox Series X console have reportedly leaked. This is from Tom Ivan at VGC. Images showing a white, all-digital Xbox Series X console have seemingly leaked. The low-quality images appear to show a white version of Microsoft's existing console that's similar in form apart from the removal of its disk drive. Xputer reported last month that Microsoft was planning to launch a white all-digital Xbox Series X console this summer. It claimed that the console will include a few upgraded components, such as an improved heatsink, but that elsewhere there will be no major enhancements. And really, that's just them saving money, right? You improve the heatsink so you can use fewer materials, and that saves them a little bit of money, which is mostly what these things are all about. It's reportedly expected to retail for less than the current Xbox Series X console, which launched in November 2020 and has a, an estimated retail price, or it was, uh, yeah, of $500, basically. Although it's often available for significantly less, and that's the launch Xbox Series X. So this is going to be less than that. Marcus, let, let's start there. Are, do you have any, is this appealing to you at all? A white, all a all digital Xbox Series X with no disk drive? And if it is, how much would you pay for it? Uh, no. <laughs> but, I mean, I'd say that as someone that already owns a, a regular Xbox Series X. Same. So like, I don't need one. And 
also like I'm an old man and I still like like a disk drive, which I contradict myself constantly because I don't think I I own maybe three physical games of this generation. I I, right. I am a digital I, I'm part of the problem. <laughs> I just buy <laughs> digital games, but I still just like having the option because you never know, you know. Um, so, yeah, I still have a hard time reconciling with the idea of having an all digital box, even though I, if I probably ripped that bandit off, I'd be fine. Um, so, I mean, like, I I don't need it. Like, I'm, I have a working Xbox. Uh, it's cool that it's cheaper. It's always nice to get cheaper versions of of things you know especially these days uh especially if, it, if it's like a little bit better it sounds like just like you know some of the stuff in there is a little bit better yeah uh, it, so it'll, yeah, it'll, it'll probably have like a, a smaller chip uh it'll probably have a smaller system on a chip so that they do need less heat sink so that's probably what this is they're like they're um getting uh, better performance but they're what they're gonna so instead of using that to get better performance in games they'll just like lower the clocks have it run at a lower heat uh, and so a lower frequency, which produces less heat, which means they need a smaller heat sink and all those things combined enable them to make something that saves them a lot of money. And that's what this yeah. will be about is saving them money. Yeah. I wonder if they would like, if this will replace the current series X, like, will they just sell through what's left and stop manufacturing it? Or if they're going to come continue to produce Pro those alongside this other one probably not and the reason i say that is because it's less money right if this if they are yeah. charging this for uh charging less money for this i think part of them is like we don't want to backtrack on the gains we made in, in increasing prices so this goes in at 450 dollars. probably that's where i would expect it to, to launch at and then mm. the other one stays at 500 uh and, and then you just have both on the market for one you don't want to have a lot of people being like, they are definitely trying to move us all to all digital. Even though they are, they don't want to make it obvious that that's what, what is happening. They want to say the options thing. We give you options and then you can decide. Um, and they're right. going to, they want to keep doing that. I don't think they want to like pull that away and make it clear what they're trying to do. And then, you know, if you begin, if you have a $500 system and now the $500 system goes away and you only have a $450 system, when you go back to, to launch a new, new hardware for next generation, now it's like, oh, we're jumping from 450 to whatever the price is for that next thing instead of 500, 500 to whatever the price is for the next thing. And in people's heads, that's just like more, a, more, a difficult challenge for Microsoft to overcome. So I think keeping both in stores will be the answer for them. It provides a lot of like solutions to their, the arguments they make with gamers all the time, I think. Yeah. The only downside is that uh, messaging, uh, which has always been the big problem with the Xbox series brand, is the confusion of like, well, which one is which? What's the difference between an X and an S? And now you have another X out there. So then there's two X's and then you have to be like, well, which one? One has a disc and one does it. So like, what do you call the X without the day? Is it just the Xbox series X digital edition? And then okay. like, how is that immediately clear to someone that just at a glance it's not. looks at a bunch of Xboxes and goes like, okay, what's the one that... I you call, you call it the what's... sad again, right? I mean, I know, I know that was for the Xbox One S all digital, the sad, uh, but that's now what I associate with these digital ones. The Xbox sad uh, is back, everybody. Here we go. Yeah, um, Xbox D X hyphen D, and it's like minus disk drive is what it means. <laughs> and they'll think that it's really clever, but it's actually extremely confusing. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's almost certainly what's going to happen is they'll have something they think is clever, and we'll all be like, what does this mean? Uh, or it'll be something stupid when we look at it, be like that. That's a joke, right? And it's like, no, they mean it. <laughs> uh, all right. A big shakeup at Nintendo Testing Center ahead of Switch 2. Nintendo, and I think this comes from Kotaku. Shout out to Kotaku. Uh, Nintendo of America is restructuring the small army of contractors that help test its games and hardware in its Washington state headquarters. The company confirmed to Kotaku. According to our current and former contract, according to four current and former contractors. The result is a massive downsizing that comes amid layoffs or layoffs across the rest of the video game industry. And after the Mario maker reportedly delayed the launch of a switch to successor until 2025, these changes will involve some contractor assignments ending as well as the creation of a significant number of new full-time employee positions. A spokesperson for Nintendo told Kotaku in an email Contractors at Nintendo of America who feel undervalued and underpaid have long called on the company to make them full-time red badge employees instead of exploiting loopholes in seasonal work requirements. While some of them are now finally getting converted to direct hires, others, including testers with over 10 years of experience, are getting the boot, though Nintendo says everyone impacted will receive severance packages. When contacted for comment, a spokesperson for Nintendo provided the following statement. 
Nintendo of America has reorganized its product development efforts or its product testing functions to drive greater global integration in game development efforts. The changes will also better align NOA with inter-regional testing procedures and operations. These, cha these changes will involve some contractor assignments ending as well as the creation of a significant number of new full-time employee positions. For all assignments that are ending, the contractor contractors agencies with NOA support will offer severance packages and provide assistance during their transition. For those contractor associates who will be leaving us, we are tremendously grateful for their uh, important contributions they've made to our business, and we extend our heartfelt, th heartfelt thanks for their work and the service to Nintendo. Uh, Marcus, so I, I think really the underlying story here is uh, that Nintendo probably just doesn't have a lot going on for this next year, and they're looking at, hey, we have all these contractors that are here to test games, and they've kind of gone through and tested all the games that we have ready to go. Nintendo is a company that does um testing and and and, and things for the and development like way ahead of time and then they keep these games on the shelves and it feels like the games that we're going to get this year from nintendo you know we're about to get through uh here in a couple months the games that they've already announced including um uh, mario paper mario the thousand year door and luigi's mm -hmm. mansion 2 hd and then after that there's not a lot left for them to to, to talk about because they've already announced that those two games and nothing else after that but if they have games to release after that, it's likely going to be stuff like the Fire Emblem remake that is has been rumored and been finished for quite some time, or Metroid Prime 2 and 3 uh, HD remasters, which are have also likely been done for a long time. Uh, and then there's a handful of other games that are probably in a similar position. So it's like they don't have a lot of big first-party AAA games for these people to work on. And it sounds like instead of keeping them around, they're just going to end those contracts and reorganize and move on from there. But it's like, man, even Nintendo, I get they're, they're, they've delayed the Switch too, but even Nintendo doesn't have a lot of games coming up for these te for these people to work on. It just feels like we went from this high tide of a million games coming out because the pandemic ended, and now we've mm -hmm. fallen off a cliff. It feels kind of rough out there, Marcus. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, no, that's that's been the story of like just all these layoffs, right? Like everyone rode the wave of the pandemic and then it <laughs> abruptly ended. Everyone's like, oh, crap. Okay, what do we do? Um, so it is... It, it's not surprising, but it is weird to hear Nintendo being part of this because they've been largely absent from like all this talk about like mass layoffs and, and stuff like that. So it's like, oh, there it is. There, there's theirs. It finally caught up to them. Um, right. You know, though. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it it, it sucks. It, it, it you would think that once the Switch Two does come out, which you know whatever next year, whenever that's supposed to be, you right could pay to keep them on board for like whatever you got going on over there. But again, if they have nothing of like, would they just be, I mean, it feels like there's always something you give them to do, but if they think like if you're just going to be sitting on your hands basically until we have switched to launch titles ready to go or, or whatever that looks like, I guess, you know, I get, I can only assume they looked at their pipeline and was like, well, the, the, the gap between then and now is too large. It would be, it would make more sense to just, you know, say goodbye to, to some of these people. Uh, so, you know, it sucks, you know? Yeah, I mean, this, this does feel like the kind of thing where it's like, um, these people probably were in a position to like, okay, we're, we're, we're here. We, we know there's going to be a lot of work because you are going to probably have us test Switch 2 and the Switch 2 UI and, uh, you know, Switch to like the new store. And then, and then just like the actual using of the new device in addition to any and all of the games that would have launched alongside the Switch 2. And that stuff probably would have been kicking off like right now. And then for them to be like, we're delaying all that stuff, and we don't necessarily know exactly when it's going to be coming out now, although no time before March of next year, like at the earliest. That's the internal reporting, or that's the reports out of those internal communications. So it's like, okay, um, if you are Nintendo of America and you are like looking around and be like, we are just going to probably in because the way the contract works and i'm not i'm no expert on labor law but the way i understand it is like you have to keep these contractors around for a certain amount of time but if you keep them around for any time longer than that then you do have to take them on as full-time employees or they have to be not employed as you by, by you as a contractor for a certain amount of time and then you could bring them back so it sounds like they're trying to time that up a little bit here um and in the meantime what that what that actually looks like is Nintendo is paying less money to employ people for their labor. And so it's basically the, the effectively the same thing as layoffs uh, because yeah. they just are not spending as much money on labor right now. And it's a, it's a shame, I guess, good news for the people that did get those full-time positions. Um, and I hope that, that these contractors are able to come back and do all this work when, when Nintendo is paying for it. But in the meantime, it's like, this just feels callous, like all these decisions in this business right now. Um, what do you when do you expect the switch to to launch and do you do you think it could come out by march of next year because right now i'm like 
even that seems like they're not even planning for that. That that feels like if that if that was happening, it's like why not kind of just get started right now? That gives you about a year to get there with all this testing. And if they're like, no, we don't even have any games to test for that right now, it's like, man, really? I, I don't. know. It seems strange to me. What do you think? Yeah, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> I, right, so, same. That's where I'm at. I yeah. don't know. It's like you could throw any date. Like I mean, I mean, I probably my ceiling is like. I have a hard time believing holiday next year. Like, I don't know. I don't think they could get through a whole nother year of like, you know, nothing basically. Uh, so it's almost like they kind of have to hit that March day just to make the, this sort of like weird drought of brand new stuff shorter. But like, I, I just without the, the context of like how far along it is and what they're trying to do and just anything. It, it feels like it, it, it's so nebulous now, but so it's like, you tell me a, a window. I'm like, sure. I I yeah. guess I have no choice but to believe you. So, yep, sir. <laughs> that's not, that's exactly where I'm at. Where it's like this is a company that is, I I you know you start you get in a pattern with them. You're like okay, okay they're going to launch that thing at the end of this year. They're they're coming up to the end of the games they have announced, and then we'll just go into to these holidays. There will be a switch to it makes all the sense in the world. And they're like ah no we want to take a little bit more time on the games. It's like oh yeah the, Nintendo is in a position where they feel like they can do that. So they're going to do that, but then it's like, well, okay, well, then what does it look like? Are they going to launch the game or launch the system in the first half of the year like they did with the Switch? Because they did that because the Wii U was floundering. So it kind of didn't matter when they launched the Switch. It's like they just needed to get something new out there to restart the generation for them. And uh, it's like, okay, yeah, so I guess they could do that again, but why would they do that in a world where the Switch is do doing so well and they can kind of like ride that for some time, even if they aren't selling a ton of new, uh, ton of new hardware, which... They actually kind of are still like it's dipping in the, in North America. It's dipping in Europe. It's continuing to sell very well in Japan, though. It's like, why wouldn't they just keep riding that? It seems like they might. So, yeah, very unpredictable company. It's going to be hard to know exactly when they're going to pull the trigger on that device. Yeah. Maybe Switch 2 is done, but they're just waiting for Metroid Prime 4 because they really want to like, really got to launch it with this. So like, they're like, we're waiting on you, Retro. It's I, not us. <laughs> I still am in the camp where I believe it's possible we get Metroid Prime 4 on the original Switch, but I, uh, I'm i ready really? to have egg on my face for that. Yeah, you don't have to say it like that. You don't have to say it like, <laughs> I'm a terminal patient. Like, oh, really? Oh, you think that? I don't, I don't want to. It's like, yeah, when somebody <laughs> tells you that they still believe you, like, really, that's what you believe. Okay, well, I mean, you know, that's, that's cool. You know, God damn, I'm not Marcus. here to judge. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably be right though I, i'm trying to i'm trying to accept it but i want to i want to keep believing yeah, uh hey, I respect right. it. thank you i appreciate that all right moving on here sig of america workers ratify union contract protecting 150 employees this is for michael mcwarder and nicole carpenter at polygon workers at sega of america voted tuesday to ratify their first collectively bargained contract with the u.s arm of the video game company granting new protections and raises for about 150 full-time and temporary employees Workers in the union, known as Allied Employees, Allied Employees Guild Improving Sega, or Aegis, won important concessions from Sega of America as part of the contract, building base building raises for all employees, layoff protections, and a commitment to crediting people on games they've worked on, including early QA testers. It also affords employees in the union other protections, including letting workers pursue creative work in addition to their work at Sega and a guaranteed con continuation of hybrid work. Workers are, uh, will also receive just cause protections, joining tender clause workers and being the only ones in North America video game industry to have them, organizers said. In the state of California, where Sega of America's offices are located, workers are employed at will, meaning employees, uh, employees can, or employers can terminate employees for almost any reason, provided that reason is not unlawful. These protections mean employers must follow a series of strict guidelines before getting rid of a worker, whether through firing or other means. Um, some, some good news. It feels like this is like the, um, the one hand that goes with the other. We are in a volatile uh, time for this business, which is like traditionally very volatile. Uh, so people are experiencing it in a way where it's like we, when we were in the high times of every game was making a ton of money and, um, and people were spending more time on games through the pandemic. It was very easy to look around and be like, you know, yeah, Hey, we'll talk about unions because protections are needed and i've i've lost marcus so we'll see if he hops back in oh there he is but marcus is already back uh can you hear me marcus maybe not we'll see oh he's getting connected right there so when we were in the, those high times it was very easy for, i think people to talk about unions for the protections they could have provided for a, a number of reasons um 
and I'm going to make sure I still am not losing an OBS. We're good there. Uh, but it was also very easy to be like, ah, that's a lot of work. Why we, why would we do that? Uh, we, we're kind of getting everything we need from these companies. Uh, you know, we, we feel secure in our positions. And now that, that that volatility has really come home, I think that these companies are, are like not are like looking at empl employees as human resources that can be cut as needed. And we've seen that repeatedly now. And so unions are this weapon. I think after so many years of talking about it, now people are like, we can actually wield this as a powerful tool to get what we need. And it's, it's awesome to see that Sega is making that happen. Uh, Marcus, I, I, it says you're muted. I don't know if you can hear me. It seems like you are still trying to get connected. Uh, feel free to restart Discord if you need to, and we'll get you back in here. In the meantime, let's, uh, you know what? Let's move on to this next story. Rumored Toys for Bob is making a new Spyro game. This is from Jonas Mackey at Game Reactor. There have been a lot of news pieces written about Toys for Bob this year. First, they were negatively affected by Activision Blizzard's layoffs. Then they were th thought to be shut down after that, that it was revealed that they are leaving Activision Blizzard to become an independent studio, and most recently that Microsoft will publish their, their next project. So it's been quite a roller coaster for them. So what is that next game? When the split from Activision Blizzard was announced, the studio wrote that our team is excited to develop new stories, new characters, and new gameplay experiences, which sounds like something spanky new. On the other hand, during a recent meeting with its staff, uh, corporate vice president of Microsoft Studios, Matt Booty, reportedly said that the studio's upcoming title will be similar to games Toys for Bob has made in the past. And now the very known Crash for Band Crash Bandicoot and Spyro content creator Canadian Guy A says in a new video that he knows what is what, that it is named Spyro 4. He says he heard this from several developers during Games Developer Conference and also rumors before that, and it has been in active de development since January 2024, which is like two months ago. So pretty wild. Uh, we've completely lost Marcus now, so I think he's restarting Discord. Uh, but this is something that I, I'm, not, I'm not too surprising. I think on a Bombcast, we were talking about this, where we were saying, hey, you know, what would we want them to do? And I think all of us kind of settled on, hey, a new Spyro makes a lot of sense. Um, they did just do Crash 4, uh, so it's probably some time before they'll get back to Crash Bandicoot. Uh, Banjo-Kazooie is another possibility, but they've likely already have, if, if Microsoft is making a Banjo-Kazooie, they probably have already gotten someone making Banjo-Kazooie, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. A Spyro game makes a ton of sense, and Spyro Ford, like, kind of being like, hey, let's forget all those other Spyro games that came out. Let's instead just make the next real Spyro game. That's something that I think worked for Crash, and they want to replicate that with, with Spyro as well. Uh, I, I'm excited about this to a certain extent, and at the same time, I'm like, I liked Spyro when I originally played it. I played it a lot more with that Spyro uh, remake trilogy. And I'm like, these are well-made games. They're decent. I just, they didn't never blew my socks off. So I was kind of, I was mostly like, eh, I, I, I think Spyro's okay. Um, I, I'm really, I'm, 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 that make, makes it sound more negative than I even intend. I don't think Spyro's bad in any way. I just think I would like to, if the studio was doing something a little bit more exciting to me personally, but I know a lot of people really like Spyro. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, Jamie H. Christmas used to Spyro greater than Crash. I agree with that. That's true. That's definitely the case um, for me personally, at least. Uh, although Crash 4, I think maybe Crash 4 is actually a little bit above Spyro at a certain point. Um, all right. Game, game developers are being sued for making their games too addicting. This is from Alex Hopley at Game Reactor. A new lot of lawsuits have been filed against the likes of Rockstar, Mo Yang, and hey, Janet Cho, everybody. Look at that. Oh, never mind. I see Marcus. I he heard is. addiction, and I came running. <laughs> <laughs> we got the addicted boy himself here. Uh, let's see if we can get Marcus in here. Uh, Marcus, are you there? It says you're muted. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get connected. It seems like you're with like some connect problems with Discord. We'll see. Give him a second. Uh, in the meantime, Alex Hopley at Game Reactor writes, a new lot of lawsuits have been filed against the likes of Rockstar, Mojang, Mo Yang, Mojang, Activision Blizzard, Epic Games, Roblox, and more for making games addicting. Multiple complaints have come from all across the United States targeting game developers for suppose, supposedly exploiting players. One lawsuit from Arkansas alleges that a woman has seen a strong decline in her son's behavior since he started playing addictive video games. She first noted these behaviors when he was 12, which other things might happen when you are 12 years old, but whatever. Now 21, the son is reported to spend, uh, spend $350 a month on games, has dropped out of school, been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and experiences withdrawal symptoms that result in rage, anger, and physical outbursts. 
The suit alleges that it is the creators that are liable for the damages caused by their neglectful design, but the game developers aren't going to take this line down. Their argument is that finding their ex expression through their games to be too entertaining is not a reason to have them shut down. A lot of games nowadays reward you for time spent in them, as well as your overall skill. Fortnite's Battle Pass, for example, requires you to keep playing at risk of losing precious skins at the end of your reward track. Um, so, yeah, this is... A lot of the games, I think, mentioned this, like like Minecraft, um, Epic Games, Fortnite, and Roblox, obviously. But this uh, this uh, lawsuit like is just like, hey, uh, Grand Theft Auto is too too fun and too addicting. And uh, I, I guess Grand Theft Auto Online probably does have like a lot of Battle Pass stuff. And there's clearly like dark patterns in all of these things. There are clearly um, psychological tricks that these developers are wielding against the player to get them playing for a longer amount of time because that increases the likelihood that they'll spend more money later. Um, but at the same time, it's like, hey, they, the, the, I, I appreciate the developer's position here that they are making the game more entertaining and making people want to play for longer. And that's what a lot of people want from these games. So where's the balance? I think that it won't hurt to have regulators look into this stuff, to have um, experts like actually try to figure out how these games are exploiting us. I don't necessarily know if I trust the government to be able to figure out what the answer to those problems would be. I think more information about how these games know how our, our brains work and then using that information against us in a mass way to get us to spend more money. Yeah, let's let's look into that. That can't hurt. And at the same time, uh, I don't want the games to be made worse so that I'm less addicted to them. That uh, doesn't seem like the answer either. All right. We'll give uh, Marcus one last chance to get in here while we hit the quick hits. Uh, quick hits and then and then one uh, uh, restful trails. Uh, PlayStation Store Spring Sale is on with thousands of games available at discount. Uh, so you can go ahead and check that out now. I think that's running at least through the end of the month. Uh, then PlayStation Plus is giving away Immortals of Avium, Minecraft Legends, and Skull in April. And that's Skull with one L. I don't know what that is. Thunderful is selling developers uh, heads up or head up for 500,000 euro. I think it's after Thunderful like originally acquired it for much more than that. So it's another example of one of these studios spinning off and finding a way to survive. I think that head, head up is going to a, a new company that is owned by someone that still works at Thunderful and I think originally started head up. So it's like one of these situations where it's like, eh, well, we don't wanna pay for it ourselves, but if you wanna find a way to make that go, go keep going on your own, feel free. And then finally, Sony won a patent infringement lawsuit that said its controllers used previously existing and protected technology. That was something like a, a massive number, uh, but Sony won that. Uh, it was like $500 million or something like that. Sony won that, They're, they can keep using that. Uh, so they won that, that patent infringement lawsuit. And then finally, Restful Trails to Joseph Lieberman, uh, a video game villain from the 90s. Uh, he was one of the main politicians that was bringing video games as a violent medium that was going to corrupt children to uh, to the, the, the eyes of the Senate. Uh, the, the games he would bring were like Mortal Kombat, uh, I think like Time Crisis and Night Trap, of course. So uh, that's cue the Night Trap music right there. Joseph Lieberman, of, co of course, lost that fight. Um, it was something he kept trying to go keep going even after the ESRB came around. They're like, we'll put ratings on games. Is that cool? And most politicians were like, yeah, Joseph Lieberman kept fighting that and was kind of kept trying to make a big deal of violent, violent video games. Um, and then he, of course, was the vice presidential candidate for Al Gore. Uh, so, yeah, rest in peace, I guess. <laughs> Bye, Joseph Lieberman. All right. Uh, let's get to the poll question. Let's do that. Uh, and while I'm getting that set up, uh, you know, since Marcus is having trouble getting connected, let's do one more reminder. Subscription at or subscription.gameinformer.com. Go to gameinformer.com. Sus subscribe to them. Uh, make that happen. Uh, they are doing some excellent work over there, and they have been for a while. Uh, hung, out, hung out with a lot of people from Game Informer while we were at, uh, at PAX. They are part of the Nasty Boys clan uh, that we've decided uh, is the uh, the crew that we're going to call the Nasty Boys. Uh, they uh, were a lot of fun, and of course, they're doing a lot of great work, so definitely check them out. All right, let me get this going, slash community. All right, there we go. And here is the poll question. Uh, are you okay that Larian Studios' next game isn't going to be Baldur's Gate? Um, bring that up for everybody. News assets fade. Uh, Ninety-six. Per is this is this the old poll question? Did we not do the new poll question yet again? Getting pretty bad at that. All right. Yeah. Wrong poll. I, let, I, let me refresh. I don't think we. Maybe we never put it up. All right. So we'll do we'll do two poll questions. 
Oh, yeah. Why do I... You just don't... Okay, I see. It's right there. Which one are you more excited for? This doesn't work anymore. It usually shows... Okay, there we go. Uh, which one are you more excited for? Judas from Ken Levine, Bioshock, or neither? Judas from Ken Levine, uh, it was 35%. Bioshock for 15%, and 49% said neither. So uh, almost half are not interested in either game. But when it comes to Judas from Ken Levine, a little bit more, like twice as many people are interested in that. I'm sorry, these poll questions have broke now, so you have to actually click on them to see the results. That's annoying. All right, a new poll question. How are you feeling about the future of video games? Great, I'm not worried. Good, I'm somewhat worried. And bad, I'm really worried. Uh, I kind of want to just take your guys' poll on this, a pulse on this, uh, see how everyone's feeling about video games overall. Um, I'm like, I'm somewhere in between, I think, personally. Uh, I'm like, I'm a little worried. It feel, You know what it feels like? 10 years ago, we were talking about, hey, the end of consoles, and that felt so absurd as soon as the consoles came out, the PS4 and the Xbox One, and they both did very well. And now it feels like all of the concerns we had back then are happening now, uh, where it's like, hey, live service games and mobile games, they're distracting players, and they're going to take up all the oxygen out of the room. And back then, it's like, well, no, that's absurd. We're, we're going to keep getting a million different games. And that was true for a while, and now here we are, there are like five games that pe play, people are playing and that's it. And so, yeah, I'm a little bit worried, but I wanna see what, how everyone else is feeling. Uh, maybe games are gonna bounce back in a big way uh, and that's how you feel. Or maybe you're way more worried than I am. Let's, let's see how everyone's feeling when we answer this poll question and then talk about it on Game Mess Mornings on Giant Bomb tomorrow for Dreg's Day with Tam. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we'll get the result then. Speaking of Giant Bomb, what do we have happening? We'll have voicemail dump truck later today. And then uh, on Friday, look out for UPF. Uh, we're going to probably play a handful of games. Um, I want to play, uh, uh, let's see, what do I have happening? Um, I want to play that South Park game. I want to get that going. Hey, we got Marcus back. All right. Can you hear me? Really? What the hell happened? I don't know. <laughs> you went to the Phantom Zone. I guess so. I'm, I'm back. Uh, Zod says hi. All right. Well, hey, you want to do that uh, one last pitch for a uh, Game Informer subscription? <laughs> Sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh like you mentioned up top, uh print subscriptions are back, game informer, um, but you can subscribe to us directly without going through GameStop. Uh to do that, you can go to the URL uh subscription.gameinformer.com. Uh you can get 10 issues of the magazine, both physical and digital. The subscription includes both, but you get 10 issues a year, 1991 for uh the year. It's less than two dollars an issue, and you get an 84-page magazine filled with reviews, cover stories, uh, interviews, features, profiles uh, from our staff, as well as our awesome uh, fleet of freelance contributors. And yeah, it's a great way to support uh, GI directly, and you know we really appreciate it. So you can do it right now. Subscription.gameinformer.com. And and tell people where they can find you if you want to tell them like, like your Twitter handle or something like that, uh, and where they can find your work. Uh, you can find me on. Twitter at Marcus Stewart seven. That's the number seven. You can also find me on Blue Sky at the same account, though. Admittedly, I'm, I'm much less active there. So, but it does exist. And of course, you can follow my work on GameInformer.com. Uh, you can catch us or me on my our Twitch channel as well, uh, Twitch.tv/GameInformer. I usually stream uh, a couple times a week, especially every Friday. Ongoing Super Replay series. Currently playing through the entirety of the Legend of Zelda: Majora's Mask for the first time. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, so that's been a lot of fun. So that'll be happening tomorrow. And yeah, I think that's all the plugs that I got in my bag here. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, I asked this poll question, how are you feeling about the future of video games? Great, I'm not worried, good, I'm somewhat worried, and bad, I'm really worried. How are you feeling about the future of video games? Uh, that's an issue. Uh, the future of video games in terms of like just the products themselves. Well, you can put uh, the question however you need. Like just, yeah, like uh, how are you feeling about the, you know, the variety, the quality, the uh, getting the kinds of games that you like, that sort of thing. I'm feeling good, I guess. Good. I don't know what's a, yeah, whatever's like a good, the scale. I'm feeling good about that. I think a lot of cool games are coming out, uh, whether it's like AAA or indie stuff, like, you know, variety has been great. Uh, in terms of like on an industry level, I think obviously it's, it's not great, but I, I try to be positive. I, I like to think this, you know, we'll get on the other side of this eventually. Uh, yes. so like in the like longest term, I, I like to believe that it will work out or will work itself out in some way or another. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Like, you know, not great now, optimistic for the future, as naive as that might be, <laughs> we'll see. But I like to, you know, like I, 
I want to think that we're going to get better. You know, I uh, I like that answer. I th- and I you know I think when you're right on the uh, on the uh, long term. When you look at the grand scale of time, I think we're going to be on the other side of this and like thinking back, like remember when things were really bleak in 2024 and look how far we've come. I, we will get to that point again. I, I agree with that. All right. Uh, any other things to clear up? I think we talked about what's happening on Giant Bomb. Oh, uh, yeah. Fun stuff will happen on UPF and then we'll have a BCR. We'll figure out what that's going to look like. Uh, so tune in for that as well. Thank you for watching, everybody. Marcus, thank you so much for hanging out with me today and talking about video games. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and thank you all for watching. You're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself, and goodbye.